The first reading is from Matthew verses 1 to 4. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Our second scripture comes from Luke. It's a story of a woman who uh, has not been making a lot of good choices in her life. And we're going to watch Jesus and this woman and a man named Simon live out that second beatitude. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city, who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts of both of them. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said, you have judged rightly. Then turning to the woman, but speaking to Simon, he said, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. May God add God's blessing of these words to us this morning. A story is told of... uh, a woman who wanted to talk to her pastor. And so they met in the office and the pastor, you know, what do you need to talk about? And the woman was sort of squirming in her seat and the pastor deduced that probably she had something to tell him. And uh, sure enough, the story came out. For years, the woman had been stealing money from her employer. And the pastor asked her, how much did you steal last year? And she said, I skimmed 15,000 off the top. The minister thought and said, well, next year, steal only 10,000. And the next year, only 5,000. And eventually you'll get down to zero and learn not to steal. A little later, a man came to talk to him who had a drinking problem. It seems that when the man got drunk, which was a weekly occurrence, he beat his wife. And the pastor had an idea. He said, try not to drink so much. And when you, but when you do, only beat your wife once a month. Surely she'll be much happier instead of being beaten every week, only 12 times a year. What do you think of the pastor's advice? Do you think it represents the teaching of Jesus? Or do you think Jesus calls us to stop sinning and sin no more? When Jesus tells us how to have new life, he offers us a roadmap in the Beatitudes and says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. 
Now, many people think that Jesus is talking about mourning when someone is deceased. He is not. Some people have a conjecture that maybe he is talking about those difficult times in life, and we are mourning over the change, but he is not. Jesus was talking about sin, that turning away from God and God's ways that leads to unpleasantness at best and destruction at worst. When Jesus is saying you are blessed when you realize you are far from God and God's ways, sort of like last week, you are blessed when you realize that without God, you're not going anywhere. Except this time, Jesus is being pretty specific about the type of poverty. Jesus is saying you are blessed and well on your way to a better life when you realize you and I how badly we have messed up. Because until we realize we've gone down the road, long road, there's going to be no turning back. There can be no coming back and getting a good start to get down the right road until we realize how wrong we've been. But it all starts with taking a good look at things in all phases of our life and admitting we've missed the mark. In churchy language, it is called repentance, and it leads to turning around. In fact, the root word for repentance means to do a U-turn in life. But enough about us. What about God? Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And that sounds a bit odd, doesn't it, comforted? We've just taken an honest look at ourselves and admitted the bad stuff, and that leads to comfort? Seems like that would lead to a whole lot of discomfort. It does, but only at first. There can be no comfort from God until there is admitting our sins to God. And more than that, we need to turn around and move in God's direction. Let's put ourselves in the place of the woman who goes to the banquet to see Jesus. Through a crowded hall, we see Jesus enter the banqueting hall. The others stare at us and begin to murmur, what a notorious sinner but we pay them no heed and keep moving through this place where we are not welcome. Through people who whisper our sin behind their back and exclaim or snicker. We search the room so that we can get to him before we're thrown out, before we can have a chance to do what we came to do. He's not at the head of the table where we expected him to be, at the place of honor, he's squeezed into the corner next to a fat merchant and an elderly man. We move forward fast past fine folks who raise their eyebrows as we pass. Some even mutter some harsh comments. Others look at us with pity. Then he sees us and we're frozen in place. Maybe it wasn't such a good idea to come how could he fail to notice how others react to us? How could he not know the truth about us? Maybe we should go now, slither back out through the festive clothes and delicious party smells. But he beckons us over and we go. Not because we think we should go or we deserve to go, but because we dare not disobey. He is our only hope in a place full with strangers and hostile stares. Somehow we appear at his side and he tells us to sit. He puts his hand on our head in blessing and talks to us like we are somebody. And for the first time in a long time, we start to believe that we are somebody, that we matter. And that all that we did because it was expedient or to conform to the crowd or because circumstances ground us down is gone. And we feel we'd sacrifice a lot to live his way, just to feel this peace and have real security. 
And so we break the seal on the jar and the atmosphere of the room is immediately transformed just as we have been. The air is filled with the overpowering fragrance of perfume and the tears begin to fall. They hit his feet in fat drops and we can't stop them from coming. It's been so long since we've had any real hope. We need a dry service for the ointment and so we dry his feet with our hair. The powerful perfume is wafting all over the room and so the little incident in the corner is becoming known to everyone in the room. A man is coming, pushing through the crowd. He is not happy. He will throw us out. But Jesus' hand on our shoulder keeps us by his side. And then Jesus starts talking. Simon, do you see this woman? The man nods, frowning. And Jesus continues. I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but from the moment I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Jesus pauses and the man frowns more deeply. But before Simon can comment, Jesus goes on, Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, she loves much. But he who has been forgiven little loves little. The crowd goes wild, charging Jesus with heresy and blasphemy. And Jesus stands his ground, and we are afraid for him. Who can stand against such unreasoning hate by people who will not forgive, who will not admit their own need for repentance? You know, for some reason... We think that we can have Jesus in our heart and our mind and can keep our sins. Sort of like the uh, pastor advising the woman and the man. But if you had asked Billy Graham about that, he would have told you the sin has to go. Whether you come to God and realize how far you've wandered off, or whether you realize how far you've wandered off and you come to God, sin and faith go together. One points out the other. And the fruit of the Spirit comes from repentance, that turning back to God that you and I both need. It's a decision that each of us must make. Yes, the spiritual journey will take a lifetime. We will not grow into spiritual redwoods all in one day. But there is a time to start the journey, the day to say, I've sinned and I'm sorry. So sorry that I'll seek out Jesus no matter what it costs, or it's a pearl without price. And I turn my little ship and I trim the sails to God's wind. I may bounce off the reefs. I may take in a little water from time to time. In fact, I might weather some terrible storms, but I will never head for that dark shore again. I will follow Jesus wherever he leads and trust his mercy and might. Have you made that commitment? If not, what is holding you back from full, putting your full weight on Jesus Christ? If so, how are you doing? Maybe like birthdays and anniversaries, we need to celebrate and take stock of our commitment to Jesus Christ from time to time, which is what Lent is all about. Why should you miss out on what the world can clearly not give you. No amount of money or possessions, achievement, getting even, being on top can equal it. The God who calls us to repent calls us towards peace and joy and gives us comfort. He's not about retribution. God will not allow us to wallow in our distress when we finally face our failure. God sets us free to really live, wiping it all out and beckoning a new way. We are raised to our feet. We are dusted off. 
Our wounds are dressed, our ruffled and bruised emotions are calmed. And then God does something really weird and wonderful. God gives us the ability to forgive more and more easily and deeply. God gives us the strength and courage to go back and make amends. We are gifted with the capacity to love more deeply and widely. Seems a whole lot better than chasing your tail, doesn't it? Blessed are those who mourn over their sins, for they will find peace and joy again. Amen.